Good evening. As I say, live on BBC One, here comes the number on your screen right now, 030 30 80 55 55. The courts are where the law of this land is enforced. But this week, here in Belfast, I actually cannot believe I'm saying this. Mass men have shown just how much they respect the law of this land. They went into a courtroom to sit in on a loyalist murder trial, masked up, their faces covered, sitting feet away from relatives of victims of a shooting. Like, look at this. It's crazy. Heading into court with their hoods up, hiding their identities. They were eventually told to remove their masks by the judge when it was brought to his attention. Look at those wasters there. Look at that lot. But the Lady Chief Justice says it should never have been allowed to happen. Get away. Politicians have called all of this intimidating and sinister, and the Secretary of State says, well, he can't believe it. Yes, I did see those pictures, and I simply can't believe that happened. Mm. Just simply can't believe it happened. You see, do we really think that? Because these people, that lot, and many like them, they've got such a grip in our society. And what do we do? We shrug our shoulders. And now it's getting to a stage where they are sitting in our courtrooms. These people still have sway in, in, in Northern Ireland. Groups, gangs, paramilitaries have such an influence on where lots of you live. And we want to hear from you tonight. That's why we have the lines open on BBC One right now. Alison Morris is with us tonight, crime correspondent at Belfast Telegraph. Um, how indicative is that of our society? Well, look, I'm not sure that it's at all reflective of our society, but what it does show is there are still very small pockets of people who behave outside what would consider the normals of any society. And our policing is also still, at times, on a security footing, and this is not normalised policing. I mean, I've reported in the courts for over 20 years, and the sight of masked men walking towards journalists, you're well used to that. I've seen that a hundred times. In. No, they, they don't want to get their picture taken. They don't want to be identified. But the minute they get to the doors of that court, there is security. For anyone who's never been in a court, I can all, almost describe It's almost like an airport. You have to put your bags all through a scanner, an x-ray machine. You're scanned by security, and then you're allowed to enter the court. I have never seen anyone with their face covered. You're not even allowed to wear a hat inside the court. You'd be told to take it off. Um, you know, I remember one time walking into the court during the summer and I had a pair of sunglasses on my head and I forgot to take them off and the security stopped me and told me to take them off because you're meant to be... I'm surprised you don't have your sunglasses on tonight. In, in a studio. respectable way because you're in a court of law. So I was shocked when I looked down from the press benches and I could see around a dozen men and six of them were wearing, they had snoods up over their faces, they had baseball caps over their eyes. One had like a Union Jack bobble hat on, he had a mask up to his face. And, you know, they looked like they, they were going out to, you know, scale Everest. They had that much clothes on. And then beside them, there was some guy with a pair of sunglasses on covering his face. I mean, it was a bizarre situation. Describe that courtroom to me, though. Is it, a, is it a small enough room that this should have been obvious to everybody in it or what? So this trial, because of the huge sensitivities of it and the fact that there was such a, a massive police presence, Gary Haggerty, the supergrass who was given evidence in this trial, has not been seen since 2009. He's been living in witness protection in England. He was brought in. He was accompanied by personal protection officers. Here is the really strange thing. We were all sent a direction from the court saying, I am not allowed to describe what Gary Haggerty looks like. I have sat for the past week, sitting no further than where John is from Gary Haggerty, but I'm not allowed to tell you what he looks like. I'm not allowed to tell you anything about him, how his appearance might have changed. But I was assuming for his own safety, and yet loyalists were allowed to come into the public gallery and sit and look at him. I'm assuming it was from the safety against his former associates who might want to kill him because he's now given evidence against them. But they were allowed to look at him. So I thought that was, I mean, completely ridiculous. What was the point of that court order? So I, as a journalist, I'm not allowed to say what this man looks like but, you know, mass men can come in and sit in the court. The, court. the public gallery itself is not that big. And remember, I think that we need to not be distracted by what this case was about. This is about the murder of two Catholic workmen, two family men who were just going about their business. They were electricians working on a building site in North Queen Street in 1994. They were sitting eating their lunch in a car and they were riddled with a machine gun which fired between 13 and 15 because bullets at Because they were Catholic. Them, simply because they were Catholics. At the time, they tried to say they were Republicans, but it turned out the men who shot them didn't even know their names. They had no idea who they were. They just knew they'd been given a tip off from someone on the building site who they said was UDA, that there were Catholics working on the site, and that was the only reason why they were targeted. Their families have been in their courts, sisters, brothers, children. 
ex-partners who are sitting listening to all this and they were sitting just feet away. So um, Padraig O'Murray, who is the solicitor for those families, made a complaint in the lunch recess to the police and said, this is very intimidating. And after that, then it was addressed. But that was between about 10 o'clock and maybe one o'clock before but the lunchtime. The bit, so the bit I can't understand, right, is the solicitor had to raise it with the police. Are the police not looking around for what might be happening in the courtroom? There was a police officer standing right behind them for the, the, the entire duration of this. These people masked up? Yeah, there was a police officer standing at the back of the, the public gallery of the court for the entire duration of this. I did keep looking around thinking eventually he must be going to tell them to take her hats off and put their masks down, but he didn't. That was for the duration that night. And fairness to the security staff, it's G4S do the security. They told me that they had told them to remove their masks on the way into the court, but they obviously haven't got into the lifts, went upstairs and put them back on again. Um, and, and, you know, and I will say, because the past three days' evidence in that case has been really, really harrowing, and some of the details, I'm sure, were so hard for those families to listen to. And also, it's been a real indictment in terms of RUC special branch, how they handled informers, what was allowed to go ahead here. And I feel that a lot of that, too, has been overshadowed because we had these people who were allowed to sit in the public gallery with masks on, and that has I, taken up a lot of the headlines. I, I, I spend a, a, a lot of time every morning t talking to you, and you talking to me on, on the phones, just about how, you know, I, 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 we've got a different level of nuts in Northern Ireland, don't we? And we need to be very careful that we don't keep on lowering the bar until this just becomes another shrug of the shoulders. Mass men in our courtroom, for goodness sake, at a murder trial. Have you ever heard the like of it in your life? It's like something out of a movie. First call of the night, Bran in Belfast. Morning, Bran. Good, Good evening, uh, Bran, sorry. <laughs> Not morning, evening. I thought I was still in bed there, Stephen. <laughs> yes, Stephen, can, can you hear me, Stephen? I can, go ahead. Right, just one wee quick thing. If I was walking past the City Hall where a balaclava I would be arrested, but besides that, uh, we have a, a group of people who represent these people, the LCC, where are they? And another thing too, we have we had, and I think it's still happening, politicians going to speak to the LCC, who are giving them advice on the Windsor framework. How does this all square? Will they come on and your program and, it, and condemn what they, we, we've seen today? Well, of course, the of course, the LCC is set up to help people transition away. Um, from gangsterism, from paramilitarism. John Burroughs, uh, former senior police officer, is that is that part of the problem that we have this transitioning phase and should it be over? It should be over. It should have been over a long time ago. These people are criminals. Uh, we've seen an indulgence of uh, paramilitaries. We've seen a lack of enforcement around those kind of signal offences, like people singing ooh ah up the ra or people having UVF flags. And the police don't feel supported in dealing with that. We have normalised it and legitimised it. And instead of criminalising it and actually making sure that people feel that the rule of law applies to everybody in this country, we've created a two-tier justice system. That if you are an honest, law-abiding citizen, if you so much as break the law, or if you uh, break a COVID regulation, you will get no mercy. But if you're linked to a paramilitary group, if you're linked to a gang, if you've got political connections, I'm afraid to say, you are treated differently. And we've got ourselves in this situation where we punish the compliant, and unfortunately, we turn a blind eye to the difficult. And that has got a, a rot into our rule of law. And what we've seen on Monday, I think is probably the latest red flag around that. And I take this right back. You can look at things like the Bobby Story funeral. Uh, in this country, we were able to give a ticket to the serving prime minister and the former prime minister, but not one person who attended the funeral. We had a number of people who gathered for a terrible uh, atrocity, the memorial of it, on the 5th of February, 2021, 41 people gathered in Norma Road. It was a breach of COVID, premi fasci, not a single ticket. And the same would have happened if these were loyalist uh, events or politically connected events. But individuals- So is there, what are you saying? Are you I'm saying, saying there is a, a two tier- a of law for yes, paramilitary gangsters. I'm saying that the, all of the justice agencies, there's been a culture of turning a blind eye or taking the path of least resistance. And I think some of those involved in the justice system think keeping a lid on things is what their objective is, instead of applying the law rigorously and impartially and protecting the public. 
Well, I mean, a blind eye? No, I mean, I, I suppose if I want to go back, I, I don't want to get into it because it's a completely different argument. Those COVID regulations should never have been enforced by the police in the first place. It should have been left up to wardens. It wasn't a policing matter, it was a health matter. But I do think, I mean, I probably spend more time talking to paramilitary sex prisoners, people from loyalist Republican groups than most. And it's not just one group. They don't, they don't all behave or move in the same way. Some transitioned very, very successfully very early on and they moved into politics, community work, or they just went away and got on with their lives. Um, others then were in the process of transition and then we have events and things that set that back. So we know that policing, for instance, when Sinn Féin signed up to that, some people then maybe left that mainstream republicanism and went on into distant republican groups, albeit in small numbers. We then had something like the flag protests that put a stop to some transition and pushed things back again and seen young people recruited into those organisations. And now I suppose we have things like Brexit and the Windsor Framework, which they say is preventing transition. Some groups are very far along on that, that path and they are ready to completely transition and turn into sort of old boys commemorative societies if you like. Others continue to recruit and others have just, and there's no other way of saying this, they're just organised crime gangs. They're not even paramilitary groups anymore. They maybe use that but they are groups that are heavily but, involved in criminality and there's too much money there for them to transition. But who do you Why think, would that? Who do you think that was walking into that court? Well, I know who that was because we know that because of the person who has pleaded not guilty in this case is a guy called James Smith, Jimmy, Jimmy Smith. Um, he is from Rathcool. He is a former UVF life sentence prisoner and they were people who would be associated with the Rathcool faction of that loyalist organisation here, supporters of him. UVF. And that's who they were, yeah. The UVF was sitting in court masked up. Well, they're people who would either be supporters or, or of the UVF, but they were supporters of Jimmy Smith, who is a former UVF life sentence prisoner. And walking so past the police in the court. To work out who it was. Well, they didn't get walking past them today. Let me tell you, the police were waiting, at them, waiting on them at the gate. They made them remove their masks and hoods, but because of ourselves and the media that were there, some of them were trying to still not get their, their photographs taken. They were um, on their best behaviour in court today, but on Monday, yes, they walked past the police. They were told off by the security staff to take their masks off. They put their masks back on and they were allowed to sit in the court for six hours for, Callum, for, we'll, from we'll, one o'clock. We'll, we'll, we'll come to you in a second. Maliki in Belfast. Hello, Maliki. How you doing, Stephen? Yeah, it's something that I think a police guy there, sorry, I don't, didn't get his name. John Burroughs. John Burroughs is absolutely 100% right. It's a two-tier justice system. You know, I'm not going to go through my whole rigmarole because I've been on your show before, but intimidation, theft, and then finally beaten out of a business. And when I went I think to you should the... remind people, you were in a business, you wouldn't pay protection money, is that right? That's correct. And uh, between, between threats... Um, on both me and my family, and then um, just a, a, a litany of, of things that they've done to me. They stole money on me, they attacked my car, they threatened my family, they were going to burn the premises down, and eventually I was badly beaten. And um, What did they, they do to you? They beat me up with baseball bats, and in actual fact, in one of the phone calls that I got from him one night, and I don't mean this to, to, to be any disrespectful to you, as you know, I've been on your show for many, many a year. What they actually said was, we'll burn, the we'll burn the place down with you in it, and your fat boy Nolan will not be able to help you anymore. So, you know, it's, it's, we're well tuned in on what, what was going on. But when I ended up in the high courts in Belfast, um, you know, the judge said to me, I, I ended up, end up in the bankruptcy court. The judge um, asked me to, to raise money to get out of it, the tune of £36,000, which I had to beg, steal and borrow to try and get. And when I produced that amount of money, um, and it was difficult, obviously, with all the stuff that was going on, I was then quizzed by the judge, where did you get the money? Where did the money come from? I had to produce bank statements, um, loans from, from, from family members to show exactly where this money come from. I then spent over the next three years in excess of £25,000 on legal fees to try and get the, the courts to realise that I was intimidated and beaten out of my business, which they never, they never really took into consideration. Which is why a lot of people, Maliki, pay protection money. Like that's which is why a lot of people let the look. If these people, if these people can walk into our courts with that amount of impunity, uh, then how can they not intimidate people like you and many, many businesses up and down Northern Ireland? Like, well, just, just kind of, just kind of, just finish, uh, Stephen. So, at the end of the day, I even said to the, to one of the judges. 
um, you know, there's money given to these people to transition into um, law-abiding citizens. But I said to them, you know, I, I, I can take you in a car tonight and I can go around Belfast and show you houses that are, you know, £20,000 with bulletproof windows in them. There's £100,000 Range Rover sitting outside. There's £50,000 Mercedes parked outside the door. Could someone tell me that why can I not get in their police car tonight? Because I don't care anymore about these guys. They can come and get me if they want. Go to these houses. Go to these, these lift these cars and, and bring them to Wilson's auction house. Auction them off and give me the money that I can then try and buy myself out of my liquidation. Because I've been told now that I'm going to be evicted from my home and they're going to sell my furniture. This is the state that's doing this to me. And yet these boys that put me in this position... Yeah, you tried to stand up to them. ...are still driving £100,000 cars. Oh. Yeah, you, you tried to stand up to them and, you know, you, you could you be supported? I don't know how you beat these people, quite frankly. F Father McGill, meanwhile, you know, there are children beaten up by these people. Uh, there, there are, you know, they're, they're, they're drug dealers, they're gangsters, they're extortionists. They now intimidate witnesses and people in courts. Are they unstoppable? No, they're not actually, but uh, I've certainly listened to Alison a little bit earlier when she talks about organised crime gangs and at the end of the day that that's really what they are. No, they're not, and I suppose part of it is, is trying to build that civic courage to be able to stand up to them. I welcome the fact that Maliki is prepared to sort of say, no, I am going to stand up and well, I'm not going to... look what he got for standing up. But he's still prepared to do that, and right at the end, what he was he saying lost there... his business, he's going bankrupt. Yes, but he's still prepared. Uh, uh, he's a real example of somebody who said, well, I'm not actually going to let them beat me. So the very fact that actually people are... Are they not beating them? But the very fact that he's still... You heard him at the end, or at least I hope you heard him at the end, sort of saying, I'm still going to say that. He's still on your show. He's still speaking out. And we need more and more people who are prepared to have that courage to speak out and say, I'm not going to accept this. I admire... I'm just very conscious in about a week's time, we're going to look at... You know, the question of um, journalists being attacked throughout the world and, and danger. So I admire the likes of the courage of, of Alison here and other journalists as well. And indeed, the fact that you've, you've focused on this issue a number of times. We need to continue to focus on it as well. I feel, I feel awful when you're even saying that, when I know that despite the, the risk to me is minimal right now, there are journalistic colleagues standing in the middle of Gaza where bombs are raining down on them, you know, and there are the people who are really putting themselves at risk to report on the front line. My job, you know, you get a bit, bit of shouting and a bit of abuse and you have cameras outside the house. But um, I think in the main, I'm probably safe, safe enough. Um, I do think that what we need to do is the transition in money. And that, that is part of the Fresh Start Agreement, is look at those young people and how we can empower them. Does because, the transition money need to stop? Well, the transition money more or less has stopped in many areas. If you look at what happened after Fresh Start, um, a lot of that money is now being employed into women's groups and, to, and into young people and to try and to um, educate and empower rather than just going to what I used to call the gatekeepers. All that money was fed through paramilitary groups. It never made its way to where it was meant to go. There's a real effort to try and change that. There is still some money going to some groups. I think it should come with more caveats. If there, someone is caught involved in any kind of criminality, I think that the money should be should cease and their ability to, to claim the money should cease. The of criminal gangs, I mean, we, we, look, how long are we going to let this run? It is a rot that is destroying confidence in the criminal justice system. You know, why do we keep giving opportunities for these individuals to transition? The easiest way to transition is to stop doing what you were doing. Stop at full stop. We don't make apologies for pedophiles, for burglars, for robbers, but we give someone a paramilitary badge of honour and we create legitimacy around it. I we think, let them walk think that into that's the very court. easy to say if we're all sitting in lovely middle-class suburbs and you're not talking about a 16 or 17-year-old who's dropped out of school with no education and they're being coerced into these groups and they're being groomed. And you can't just say, mate, just stop it and go and do something useful with your life. They, they need to be given the empowerment that they can stand up and that young people can. And one of the things they keep writing about too is the housing system, how that's being manipulated by paramilitaries in order to control areas. It's such a big, massive faction, a group. And just to say that people should just stand up or just walk away... I think is incredibly naive and it comes from a position of privilege because if you live in, in a place where you have that kind of privilege, what I witnessed in the court on Monday can look completely alien. You can say, why isn't something done about this? And then if you drill down and when you when I was sitting in the court when those people took off their masks, there were some of them were far too young to ever be linked to any power military group mm -hmm. that it was meant to have called a ceasefire in 1984. They were not old men, you know, they were young men. Well, I think whenever they're able to walk past the police and they stand looking like they are, they well, that, swagger, would be, that would be a matter for you and your ex-colleagues. They, 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 they swagger into that. court. They act with impunity. We actually then create a badge of honour around them, which attracts young people to them. Uh, and actually what we need to do is start stripping their assets off them. 
start showing them they're not in charge. As soon as the police stood up to them today, these people melt away because they don't actually have lots of support. There isn't riots in the street anymore whenever the police stand up to them. I think we not just sanitize them, I think we give them too much credibility. Well, and we need to start cracking down on them and supporting victims and not perpetrators. Well, when people talk about how much Northern Ireland has moved on, it's also worth remembering how much of our news and politics is still overshadowed by protests and paramilitaries. The troubles are over, but paramilitarism still persists. The Paramilitary Crime Task Force was brought in to help officers in the Causeway Coast and Glens area. It followed a rise in shootings linked to the North Antrim UDA. At the front marched around a dozen people carrying flags dressed in paramilitary style clothing their faces covered. There are strong loyalist paramilitary influences around this estate, but no group was mentioned on the graffiti and no one has claimed responsibility. Nightly attacks and widespread intimidation. Earlier in the week, a crowd of masked men gathered at the courthouse before making their way to a housing estate. Well, Tom Elliott, Sales Unionist Party, Tom Elliott with us uh, tonight. You know, Tom, I, I, I remember the pressure the Nolan Show came under when we started looking at SIF, the Social Investment Fund. I remember uh, being called up to Stormont by pretty senior people to be told off for even looking at that. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and that was a fund where there was a lot of money going to the boys, let me tell you. And it seems as if there's a lot of money, a lot of resource, and John's saying a lot of blind eyes being turned on these people. Why? Well, thanks, Stephen. Uh, first of all, while I agree with most of what John has said, I wouldn't like uh, people to think that all of politicians treat the law with disdain and can break the law just uh, at, at a whim uh, whenever they, they feel like it. It certainly is the case uh, for some, and, and we have seen that in, in protests, we have seen that in uh, funerals, we have seen that uh, in other instances. But you're right, Stephen. I think the, the one of the major problems is that they started feeding uh, these people with, with finance uh, in, a, in a, I suppose, in a trial uh, to bring around some reconciliation. But the reality of it was whenever they, they kept giving these people finance, they wanted more and kept coming back for more. And therefore, it should have been uh, stopped. In fact, in my view, it shouldn't have been stop started. So and here I know what what. Sorry. I know at one stage, Stephen, just to finish this point, I know at one stage it was almost a quid pro quo in that, you know, Republicans get a, a, an amount and, and loyalists get a amount and, and that'll see both of them uh, kept happy. Here's a simple question. Why should they stop? Uh, why, why should they transition? Because the money might stop after they've transitioned. Is, is there not a built-in incentive for them to continue to transition? Because that's when the while the funding flows. That's right, Stephen, and, and I'm not disagreeing with you, and that's why I'm saying it shouldn't have started in the first place. These people are either going to be law-abiding citizens or they're going to continue with criminality. And, you know, I, I'm sure, as Alison said, uh, there are many people that, that have transitioned, that have got on with their lives and, and made the move and, and possibly uh, made poor judgments and, and poor mistakes in, in years gone by and they've got on with their life now. But there are others that didn't, and, and others have continued that criminality. And we've seen it in court. We've seen it at funerals where people fire shots over coffins. Uh, and, and we see it uh, with people wearing masks, carrying coffins and, and escorting uh, coffins, uh, flag protests. There are many others. And I just think that it's time that these people got support. I accept Alison's uh, point that when you live in a, a massive housing estate, where there are incentives almost for people to join these criminal groups, and I don't call them terrorists or paramilitaries, they are criminal groups, 
those people in those communities need support from the, the organisations and indeed from, from government to put in place organisations there that will help and support those uh, young people well, particularly to keep them well, away from let, those uh, criminal organisations. Let's hear from John in Belfast. Hello, John. Hello, Stephen. Go ahead. You know, I'm just thinking, there's probably not a country in the world <clears throat> would have tolerated what happened there at that court. Could you picture that happened in the leg of America, France, Germany, Britain? I can picture it happening in some type of banana republic, or I can picture it happening you know, you know, on, on Netflix or something with sinister music running under it. I'm not even too sure about that either, so I'm not. But I know one thing. If that would have happened in any other Western country in the world, the police would have been all over the top of them. But here in Belfast, no, we let them in. We probably even directed them to the right floor. You know, I'd be down in that court, and I've seen the cor- and I've seen the corridors. You could have 50 or 60 people there waiting to go into court for different reasons. I've seen police in that in those corridors where they're going to maybe to be a witness for some some sort of criminal offence. You've got your security down there. I never got that these people get into this court. Well, they Why were asked to take their masks off them? when they went in. They then put their masks back on uh, when they, they when on they were them. in. And my goodness, if there ever was a, a security pro- uh, problem in that actual courthouse, so we understand that the judge maybe didn't see it for a number of hours. So the level of the the line of vision to the public gallery yeah. isn't great for the judge. Then the the cops, the cops are standing there with masked men with sunglasses on and hoods up, sitting in a murder trial. And nothing and happens yeah. for hours. But nothing happened until the solicitor raised it and then by lunchtime they had either gone home, reduced quite significantly in numbers, or they didn't have any masks on. For the last two days they've had no masks on and they've sat, as I said, they've been on their best behaviour after telling off from the judge. Mr Just So Hard did say he wouldn't tolerate it anymore and they'd been removed. Father McGill, have Republicans transitioned more or faster than Loyalists? I certainly think some Republicans have done a very good job on that. Um, I, I get the sense there's a real... Uh, are they hiding better or have they actually transitioned? No, I'm, I'm quite convinced some of them are, are absolutely sincere in that and they have actually. That has been put behind them. There's obviously some who are on the agreement uh, who clearly have got involved in, in criminal gangs, but some I'm absolutely convinced have left that behind. Is that because Republicans have got more out of this than Loyalists? I think my sense is that Republicans were very well organised. There was a lot of effort to actually bring them along uh, with the whole process. Obviously, some didn't go along with it, but certainly some of them did. They're strategic in their thinking and planning. Aren't Loyalists? Well, I think that in terms of mainstream republicanism, they have a political goal and they've always had a political goal, which is United Ireland, and that's an electoral process. We do have dissident republicans and we can see that we do have continuing paramilitary-style shootings, punishment, you know, what we'd have called punishment shootings in the past in republican areas. Quite often, they, they still exist. And a lot of that is to do with coercion or, or um, intimidation, or in some cases, they're being taxed by paramilitary groups to pay money. You don't pay it, you get shot. Um, with loyalist groups, I think that politically, they didn't have that same f- flow. They didn't have a political base. Those groups that represented them, such as the um, the PUP, never really had great electoral success after David Irvine. Um, and so I think that they've been sort of slightly out in the wilderness, and that's where you then seen those maybe more sinister figures then taken over. And they morphed then, um, in many cases, into small sort of fiefdoms. They didn't have an, an overall leadership. It's more like a, a section of fractured... Um, almost groups under under a structure. It's not the same as what way we've seen Republicans moving in one, almost in one mass. Alison, thanks for coming in. Thank you, Father. Thank you, John. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. All the very best. Now, night to you. Now, next.